Thanks, thanks very much, everyone. Thanks for coming out tonight. Um, I want to start with a confession. I'm not a biologist. I'm an astronomer. And so I feel a little weird talking about something that I'm not really an expert in, uh, which is what animals see. But the whole topic is something I've been fascinated with for a long time. And I've done a lot of reading. And so I thought I would just like to share some of what I've learned with people if you're interested in the, the same uh, topic. The reason I got interested, well, there's two reasons I got interested. Let me tell you about one right now. Um, this is my dog, Max. He's a golden retriever. And I walk Max every night here in Flagstaff. And for those of you who live here, you know the skies are incredibly dark. I see the Milky Way when it's up every night when I walk him. Max couldn't care less. He never looks up. There'll be a shooting star, the moon will be up. He couldn't care. For Max, a telescope is just a giant chew toy, right? <laughs> so I've always been curious, you know, does he see the stars and he doesn't care? Or can he not even see the stars, right? So it just got me thinking about that. What animals can see the stars besides us? Um, we've been inspired, we human beings have been inspired forever uh, by the stars. Uh, it helps us uh, think about a lot of the big questions that Todd was talking about a second ago. What's our place in the universe? Where are we? Uh, we've told lots of stories about constellations that we find in the sky, right? We imagine these figures in the sky, groupings of stars, and in fact, of the 88 official constellations, almost half of them depict animals. So it'd be a pity if the animals can't actually see them, right, to see what's up there. Um, we've used uh, the stars throughout history for, thing, for very practical purposes that have helped us survive things like calendars. This is Stonehenge, of course. Uh, the, the rising and setting of the stars told us seasons, when we should plant crops, things like that. So it played a vital role in our human survival, our ability to see the stars. Uh, also, our ability to navigate across the oceans, right? In the days long ago before GPS, uh, when uh, navigating by the stars was the only way to go across the ocean. So, for example, the Polynesians, as you may know, uh, were able to traverse thousands of miles of open ocean in the South Pacific, going to Hawaii, going to Easter Island, going to um, uh, uh, Tahiti, going to uh, New Zealand, all these places by their knowledge of the positions of the stars, right? So it's pretty incredible. And of course, it's inspired endless art and culture uh, as well. So this is an artist's picture of how Van Gogh might have looked painting his famous painting, The Starry Night. Again, just showing uh, how the stars have inspired us as, as a species, right? So again, what about other animals? Uh, the thing that lets us see the stars, of course, is our eyes. And in particular, our eyes consist of rods and cones. Rods and cones are these light sensitive uh, detectors that we have in our eyes. And they're quite different. We have roughly 10 times as many rods as cones. The cones tend to cluster towards the center. The big difference is the cones show color, C for cone, C for color, if you want to think of it that way. Um, and the rods are better at detecting faint light, but they don't tell us about color. So for a cone to be triggered and to send a signal to the brain, it needs to get a lot of light. So they're great for daytime uh, conditions. You see me now, you see the color around you in the room, thanks to your cones. But at nighttime, it's your rods that take over because they're much more sensitive to light. They don't need a lot of light to trigger a signal to your brain. And so when you look through the telescopes tonight, for example, uh, it's your rods that will really be detecting uh, most of what you see. So rods and cones are the things that allow us to see the stars. And in fact, all eyes of all the animals, as I'll talk about tonight, have rods and cones just in different proportions, basically. And so those will determine whether or not they're able to see the stars, essentially. Our eyes see certain colors, red, orange, green, yellow, all that. And it's no coincidence that that's the colors of light that the sun shines most brightly. in. So our eyes have evolved to pick up the most common light around us that illuminates everything, and that's the sun, right? So that's why we see the colors that we do. But those same eyes also allow us, our species, to see the stars at night, right? So it's pretty remarkable the range of conditions our eyes, our eyes are able to see under. 
Now, if you look at the animal kingdom, there are countless different types of eyes. And I'll show you some examples in a second. Some of them are very different from our eyes. It's pretty incredible, actually. Even these pictures just show some of the variations of eyes you see in the, in the animal and in the insect kingdom. We've all heard the, the children's lullaby about, or the nursery rhyme about uh, the cow jumped over the moon. The question is, can the cow see the moon, right? And that's what I want to look at. Um, for a human being, you know, how do you figure out if a cow can see the moon, right? I don't know. Um, it's, it, for a human being, it's really easy. Go to your optometrist and take an eye exam. How far down the chart can you see? Well, you got 20-20 vision, hooray. But what do you do for a cow, right? They don't like to sit in seats, for example. How do you actually test a cow's vision, or your dog for that matter, right? How are you gonna be able to figure out if a dog can actually see something? If a dog can see a color? If a dog can see uh, clearly? Scientists are clever, uh, and again, this is biologists and, and other people, um, but there are actually ways that you can figure out what an animal can see. They've done experiments, for example, with horses to test their color sensitivity. You know, if the horse responds to a certain color, it gets a treat, essentially, right? So there are ways you can design experiments that can show you an animal's uh, vision. There's something called visual acuity. That's how much detail you can see, how, how fine you're able to see. Uh, and they actually have uh, tests that they do on animals where they put different spacing between lines. And at some point, you can't see the individual lines anymore. They're too close together. And that limit's different for different types of animals. So they do experiments, for example, where uh, an animal will get rewarded if it notices that the lines are vertical rather than horizontal, sorry, vertical rather than horizontal, uh, and it gets a treat. And so there are ways to test if it's actually able to see these are separate lines, that isn't. You can get a sense of how well an animal is able to resolve uh, details. And the other thing you can do when all else fails is you can uh, dissect an eye of a recently deceased animal. You can actually look and see how many rods and cones does that eye have, and you can guess how well it would, able to, how well it would be able to see at night or during the day, for example, right? So that's important for a lot of the animals. You know, if you're, do, if you're trying to figure out whether a shrimp can, how, how well a shrimp sees, it's pretty hard to do an experiment with a shrimp or <laughs> things like that. Um, so there are other ways that people, scientists can find out what, what makes the eye tick. So, as I said a moment ago, there's a lot of animals and other creatures out there who have eyes that are quite different from ours. For example, there are some creatures that can see light that you and I can't see. We see the colors of the rainbow, right? The red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, because that's what the sun shines most brightly in. But there are animals out there that can see infrared, which is beyond what we can see, and can see ultraviolet, which is beyond what we can see as well. For example, bees. It's well known that bees can actually detect ultraviolet light that's invisible to you and me. So this is what a flower looks like, for example, seen in ultraviolet. And in fact, certain flowers have evolved uh, strips of material that are good at absorbing infrared light and they act almost like the lights when a plane comes in for a landing, they guide the bee in to the center, right? It's, it's pretty clever, it's pretty amazing when you think about it, but that's because the uh, bees can see this ultraviolet light that you and I are not able to see. It was just discovered a few years ago, most mammals, no mammals really, or very few, can see ultraviolet light. We can't, most of the ones I'll talk about tonight can't. But it turns out reindeer can. There was an experiment in Norway uh, a few years ago that discovered that the reindeer in, in the far north can actually detect infrared light. And it's maybe not surprising with hindsight because uh, in the winter in the Arctic, there's not a lot of light, right? The sun is very low on the horizon and uh, there's just not a lot of light around. Ultraviolet light is reflected almost 80 or 90% by the snow. And turns out that uh, urine and lichen both absorb ultraviolet light. So what that means is when a, a reindeer's moving around in this very low level light, if it sees a dark area, that may well be urine from one of its predators, like a, a, a wolf. And lichen, which they eat, also absorb ultraviolet light, so they appear black against the white snow that's reflecting all of the ultraviolet light, 
So it's a really good survival thing for the reindeer to have. Some snakes, it turns out, can detect infrared light uh, as well. They've got a sensor that allows them to actually detect infrared, which we think of normally as heat, right? Um, so this is uh, an illustration of what you would see versus what a snake would see. And it's, it's looking for a predator, sorry, uh, for a prey. And you see, you have a hard time kind of finding the mouse in the shadows. The snake, because it's detecting the body heat, the infrared uh, that's being emitted by this mouse, has no problem seeing its next meal, right? Uh, a recent discovery uh, is that scallops, which are just glorified clams, uh, have hundreds of little eyes that are unlike anything else we know about in nature. They act uh, like little telescopes. So the way your eye and my eye works is we have a lens in the front of the eye. The lens bends the incoming light rays and focuses it to the back of the eye, and we can see. That's how refracting telescopes work. If you go up here tonight and you go to the, the Clark telescope, for example, it has a lens in the front. It bends the incoming starlight or light from a planet or a galaxy or whatever so we can see it through the eyepiece. So that's called a refracting telescope. And that's how most eyes work. That's how our eyes work. That's how a chimpanzee's eyes work. That's how a fish's eyes work. But scallops are really weird because it turns out they don't work that way. They've got these crystals in their eye that act like little mirrors to reflect the light uh, to the retina so that they can see. In fact, they have two retinas. Um, so there's, it's a, and this was only discovered recently because it took a really high-powered microscope to reveal this. So whereas your eye and my eye work something like an old-fashioned telescope, the scallop's eyes, all 200 of them, uh, work like the biggest telescopes in the world that we're building today, where we have multiple mirrors all reflecting light to a focus. That's exactly what the scallop's eyes are doing with these little mini mirrors inside, these little reflecting surfaces. That's, it's pretty, you know, nature's pretty ingenious, right? So let me talk about a few specific animals. And I'm gonna start with the easiest one. Can a rhinoceros see the stars? Anybody wanna bet? Yes, no? How many people say yes? How many people say no? Okay, 50-50. Eh, no chance. There's no chance the rhinoceros can see the stars. Uh, and the reason is they're, they're blind as a bat, practically. They've got these little tiny eyes on the sides of their head. Uh, so they actually have two, two distinct views, right? Um, and they can't see in any level of detail. They don't have enough cones, basically, in their eyes. Uh, to be able to see with any detail. The cones, remember, are the things that need bright light and they see color, and the more cones you have, the more detail you can see. So for example, if you think about it like if you buy a camera, the more megapixels you have, the finer the resolution of your photographs, the finer the details you can see. That's what the cones are in, in your eye. These poor guys don't have many, so the world is a blur to them. Uh, uh, rhinoceros sitting in the back of this room couldn't tell the difference between me and a tree. Maybe many people can, I don't know. But the rhinoceros couldn't for sure. Wouldn't know the difference between me and a tree. Um, unfortunately, that's led to the uh, sad state of uh, rhinos being poached, right? Because they don't see the hunters coming. And so every year, about 1,000 rhinoceros are killed by poachers in South Africa uh, because of their poor eyesight. So are rhinoceros able to see the stars when any of them ever think of becoming astronomers? And the answer is no. They've got some of the worst eyesight in the animal kingdom. All right, so let's, oh, and elephants. They're pretty much the same story. They're big, they're smart, and they have a great sense of smell, but they, they have really sad eyesight, so they can't really see the stars either. Cats, the rulers of the universe. Yeah. Can, can cats see the stars, right? Everybody knows that cats have really good eyesight at, at night, for example. Uh, there's reasons they should be looking at the sky. There's things like this that call the cat's eye nebula uh, in the sky. Uh, but can they actually see it? Well, you can't see that without a telescope anyway. Cats don't build many telescopes. Um, cats have a lot of rods. Those are the things that see faint light levels. And so that's what allows them to see really well at night. They also have big pupils. I'll show you that in a second. So a cat can see in light that's six times too faint for you or me to see it. I'll show you an illustration of this little video. So this is what we're seeing here. You can't really see much. 
and here's what the cat would see in that same light conditions. So it makes a huge difference, right? Uh, as I said, the cat's pupils are about 50% larger than ours, so they let in more light under light, uh, uh, low light conditions. Um, in fact, let me show you a video uh, that you see the cat's eyes have these kind of little slits, right? But in fact, they can open up very wide to let in a lot of light. Here's a video of a cat getting ready to pounce and watch its eyes grow over time. <laughs> So again, it puts us to shame, basically. Um, but so that's how they can get a lot of light in to see under, under faint light conditions. But they don't have a lot of cones. They have three kinds of cones like you and I do. Cones that see red, green, and blue, and that lets us pick out all the colors that we see around us. Cats also have three, cone, three types of cones, but the ones that can see uh, uh, red don't function very well. So what your cat, what you would see is up here, just a beautiful scenery. What your cat would see is a little fuzzier because it doesn't have as many cones, doesn't have as many megapixels in its eyes, and it can't pick out the red. It can't, it's, they're like a person that's red, green, colorblind. That's basically what the cat is. There's a, there's a misconception that cats are totally colorblind. The whole world is gray to them. It's not true, but they are sort of red, green, colorblind, right? So the faraway world is pretty much a blur for your cat. If you did an eye exam, and let's say you had 20-20 vision, your cat would be about 2100. What that means is something that you could easily read from 100 feet away, your cat would have to get up only 20 feet from it to be able to read it at the same level. So our, our eyes in that sense are better than a, a cat. Uh, but again, they can see much fainter at night than we can. So they're good at seeing things up close that interest them. But can they see the stars? And the answer is probably no, right? They have a hard time seeing things that are far away, as I just said. They can see faint light levels, so that's good at, at night. When it's dark, you could see the stars, but they would just be fuzzy blobs, if even, to them. So cats probably can't see the stars. Let's talk about dogs, right? How many people have dogs at home? Okay, so there you go, a lot. Uh, so can they see the stars, right? Can Max, my dog, see the stars? There's, he should be able to, there's a, there's a couple constellations named after dogs. This is Canis Major, the big dog, and there's a bright star called Sirius. This is called the dog star. It'd be great if Max could ever, you know, deign to look up and see that when we're walking. Um, this is what the world looks like to you and me, beautiful fall landscape, and this is what the world would look like to your dog. The dog, again, is, is very similar to the cat in the sense that um, it can see better at night. I'll talk about that but it also can't see very far away. Like the cat, it doesn't have enough cones to really resolve things well. And so the world is kind of blurry for your dog. And unlike us and the cat, like I said, we have three kinds of cones, uh, red, green, and blue. The dog only has two. So it can't see red. So if you take a red ball and you throw it in the green grass, your dog's confused. It can't see it, right? So this is what the world looks like for Max. And now I'm starting to understand why maybe Max has no interest in the stars. Uh, they're just fuzzy blobs for him. So on a chart like this, the dog is marginally better than the cat. It seems to be about 2070, uh, but again, not nearly as good as ours in terms of uh, ability to see detail. They beat us in terms of being able to see uh, under low light conditions. So Max needs glasses basically, right? He's, he's pretty uh, nearsighted. The good news about your dog being nearsighted is they can't get a driver's license, <laughs> even in California. <laughs> Because uh, uh, you, you have to have 20-40 vision with glasses to qualify for a driving license in most states, so they're not even close. The bad news is, when you think your dog is happy to see you when you come home, he's not. He's happy to smell you. Uh, he can't see you, but he can smell you coming from a mile away, nothing personal. Um, so dogs really, really rely on their nose, right? The whole world is a cornucopia of smells for your dog. So. Uh, I didn't mention this for cats, but it's the same thing for dogs. You've seen that glow of a dog's eyes at night, right? Many mammals show that. And that's because they've got a, a reflective uh, layer behind the eye called the tapetum uh, lucidum. And it's, it's like a little tiny mirror at the back of the eye that reflects light. So light that comes in and doesn't get absorbed by the rods and the cones gets reflected again internally to get a second chance to be absorbed. And that helps them see 
uh, under low light conditions. They make the most efficient use they can of the little light that's available. So that's why you see that kind of glow in their eyes. So can dogs see the stars? No. The answer is probably no. So I'm going to give Max a break from now on and not really try and explain things to him and encourage him to look up. Um, so how about birds? Birds, as I'll show you, actually, some of them actually can see the stars. There's a constellation, there's actually multiple constellations for the birds in the sky. There's Cygnus, uh, the swan, there's Corvus, the crow, there's Phoenix, there's a bunch of different uh, bird uh, constellations in the sky. This is a, a region of gas and dust called the Eagle Nebula. This is where new stars are being born today. Uh, it's named after the eagles, after an eagle, obviously. <clears throat> Ostriches. Ostriches have the biggest eyes going. Uh, their eyes are so big, they're bigger than their brain. We all know people like that. <laughs> and that's not an exaggeration. Their eye is literally bigger than their brain. Um, so it makes them great at parties. Uh, but it turns out that the ostrich eye is actually five times larger than, your, larger than your eye or my eye. It's enormous, right? And so they've got exquisite eyesight. And that helps them see predators. And as you know, they can run really fast. Helps them see predators and escape them. Uh, they have great eyes. They probably could see the stars uh, because of, uh, you know, the, they have large pupils and many rods and cones and that sort of thing. Owls, as everyone knows, have great nighttime vision. They've got these huge eyes. I always think, you know, owls look kind of, they've got this, this look that's sort of a combination of bemused, wise, and just kind of, you know, don't care kind of thing. Um, but they've got these enormous eyes. An owl's ha uh, head is about the size of your or my hand, and yet their eyes are the same size as ours. Okay, so they're big. And that takes in a lot of light. You can see the big pupils, and it lets them see very well at night when they're hunting for their next meal. It turns out, as you probably know, owls can't actually move their eyes. They're actually kind of long tubes that are permanently fixed inside their skull. And that's why they can turn their whole head almost 360 degrees to be able to see in different directions. So they've got like the, the, the champion of eyes. Uh, and like I said, uh, they're able to hunt really well at night. Their eyes have many more rods and many more cones than our eyes do. So that helps them pick out prey. They also use, uh, they have a really keen sense of hearing too. So they can hear little mice scurrying away in the grass or whatever. Uh, but their keen eyesight uh, is, is really uh, important for them as well. So th they just beat us hands down in terms of being able to see at night. So it makes you wonder, right? A typical person with typical eyesight can see a few thousand stars on a clear night. Imagine what it's like if you're an owl where you're seeing is so much better than ours. The whole night sky might just be alive with stars. They can see fainter stars that we can see. They have sharper vision than we have. It's just gotta be an incredible view for them if they bother to look. Um, so, and it turns out it's not just owls. A lot of uh, birds of prey have these kinds of really, really well uh, evolved eyes to be able to see uh, where their next meal is. So here's a little uh, illustration, that a little video that will show you what a human sees compared to what, say, uh, an eagle uh, would see. So here's a kind of view that you and I would see uh, taken in a nice landscape, whereas the eagle's vision is just so sharp and has so much more detail, it can zoom in on the next prey. Pigeons, everybody thinks pigeons are dumb, but boy, they can see better than you or I could ever dream of. Uh, they see millions, millions and millions of colors. They see a lot more than you and I are able to see in terms of a vibrant world uh, around them. So those sorts of birds have really great eyesight, and that allows them to catch their next meal, like I said, right? Now, it turns out that a lot of birds migrate. You know, you've all seen the, the geese flying south in the, as the winter comes and that kind of thing. And so scientists have always wondered, so how can a bird migrate for thousands of miles often at night, and know where it's going, right? What does it use for landmarks? And it turns out experiments showed that some birds that are migrators use the stars, and it's really well established. So there's a bird, for example, called, called the European warbler. And the European warbler uh, actually migrates for thousands of miles each year, mostly at night. How it gets its bearings 
was determined by famous experiments in the 1960s by a German ornithologist named um, Franz Sauer. And he brought the birds to a planetarium, got them in for free. Um, he, he put the birds under a planetarium dome and would shine the lights above them for the stars. And what he found was the birds would turn in certain directions, north, south, east, whatever, depending on where the stars were in the sky. They noticed the stars and they turned as if they wanted to go that way uh, based on the positions of the stars. Another experiment uh, was done in, in 1970s by um, uh, uh, a professor at Cornell named Stephen Elman and he studied indigo buntings. These are other birds that uh, migrate over, over huge distances. He also put them in a planetarium and he found that through his experimentation that these uh, birds were able to notice the North Star essentially. They noticed the pattern of stars rotating about them and they always wanted to go towards the North or the South depending on the time of year. How did he know this? It was pretty clever. The birds were under the planetarium dome and he put them in this little container that had essentially an ink pad at the bottom. So as the birds would take steps as if they wanted to fly, it would record it with the, with the ink where they were trying to go. And he found that they always wanted to go in a direction north or south, essentially. And in fact, he found that if he fooled the birds and turned the whole sky so the North Star was in a different location, or maybe Polaris wasn't the North Star, another star was the North Star, they still figured out which way the sky was rotating and which was the, the stationary star, and they used that to get their bearings. So it's really clear that some birds do use the stars to navigate across these vast distances. So can birds see the stars? And the answer is some of them for sure. Again, eagles, owls, the bunting. Uh, many birds don't have that same level of vision, but certainly there are some birds that can definitely uh, see the stars. Uh, okay. Horses, anybody have a horse? Okay. Uh, can horses see the stars? Hopefully, there's a beautiful constellation known as Pegasus, the, the winged horse uh, up there. Uh, there's also a region of space where more stars are being born today we call the Horsehead Nebula, because it has a pretty striking resemblance to a, a horse's head. Horses have large eyes on both sides of their head, essentially. So they're very different from us. Our eyes are in the front, a horse's eyes are mostly on the side of its head, uh, which raises some interesting vision uh, issues. Uh, and they have quite large eyes. It turns out they have quite good eyes. They've got lots of rods and cones, and their seeing probably isn't that different from ours. So if you look at a chart like this again, where a human might have 20-20 vision, a horse would be 20-25, more or less. So you know, a good pair of contact lenses, and they're seeing great, basically. Um, so the thing with a horse having its eyes on two sides of its head is it can see almost 360 degrees. Its blind spot is behind it, and it's got a tiny blind spot in front of it too, but it can only sort of judge depth like we can because our two eyes focus on the same thing for a small region in front of it. But a horse does have a blind spot in front of it too. This is an illustration of what he would see a little girl and with the horses. And again, you see this little blind spot in front of it where it just can't make an image from the two eyes that are so widely separated. So here's what it looks like. I have no idea why the horse is chasing this poor girl, but there you go. <laughs> so again, that's, that's what the horse would see, right? So there is this blind spot in front of it. But that said, their eyes are good. Their eyes are just about as good as ours. Uh, they don't see quite the same color as we do again, right? In that sense, they're kind of like dogs and cats. Uh, we see more color than than a horse does. They're sort of red-green color blind as well. Uh, but it seems like they should be able to see the stars. They've got the same kind of eyes that we do. Uh, so there's no reason that they, they shouldn't be able to. Insects. Let's talk about insects for a second. Um, insects, as, as you know, have these compound eyes. And there are lots and lots of little lenses that 
take a little snapshot, and the little insect brain combines them to make an image. But the problem is, it does it with very low resolution. So a butterfly wing that look like, might look like this to you or me, it's a very low resolution image that a bug like this sees. And so it wouldn't see much detail. So what's the advantage of an eye like that? They can see almost 360 degrees. That's why it's so high, hard if you want to smash a fly in the summer. It's easy to come in five minutes before you get there. Because they can see behind them as well as in front of them, basically. So they may not have the resolution, but they, they know something's coming. If you had eyes like that, <laughs> if you had compound eyes to see, uh, so to be able to see as well as you do today with compound eye like, it, like an insect has, it'd have to be enormous, right? You would, you would not be popular for dates and that kind of thing. Um, so here's another illustration of what a human being would see and what a fly would see. The fly will see poorer resolution, less detail, and they actually process the images more slowly too. It takes more time to, to trip a signal. So watch as, as we go through. The, the fly, this is what a fly would see. It's kind of like a, just a, a bad, uh, you know, video lag or something. Um, but that's what they see. They don't see the same level of detail that you and I can. So they don't have the visual acuity. They can't see fine details. The world's a little bit of a blur to them. So for you and me, we can see the stars like this, individual stars. For an a insect like a fly or a dragonfly or whatever, the sky looks more like this. They can see patches where the sky is a little brighter but they can't make out individual stars at all, right? So it turns out, though, that's not a, a fatal flaw. There are insects that make use of this ability, nonetheless. And these are called dung beetles. You may have heard about this in the news a few years ago. So dung beetles are found in, in South Africa, for example. And as the name implies, their favorite meal is dung. And so they'll find a big steaming pile. They'll make a ball, and they'll roll it away as quick as they can because their fellow dung beetles aren't very nice and they'll try and steal it from them. So they want to make a little dung ball and roll it away as quick as they can. How do they do that? How do you get away as quick as you can? Experiments have shown, it's really remarkable, these things use the light of the Milky Way. They can't see individual stars, remember? But they can see the bright, fuzzy band of light going across the sky that we call the Milky Way, and that gives them a sense of direction. Do I head in that direction relative to the light? Do I head in that direction relative to the light? In fact, experiments show that when the Milky Way is visible, this is the path that the dung beetles took from the, the big pile uh, to get away. And OK, they're, they don't always go in a straight line. They're, they're not geniuses, right? But they make a, a pretty, pretty much of a bee line to get away. When the Milky Way is not visible, and that's experiments that were done on cloudy nights, or, believe it or not, they actually fitted little party hats on some of these uh, <laughs> dung beetles. It's got to look great on your resume as a graduate student, you know. Um, but in that case, they, they just go in circles. They don't know which way to go, right? So it's incredible that these beetles use the light of the Milky Way to figure out the, the quickest escape. Uh, but it's, it's really, there have been multiple experiments that have shown that this is true. So they can't see the individual stars, but they can see the light of the Milky Way in the sky, and that's how they do it. So can insects see the stars? And I, I went back and forth. I changed this multiple times. I think it's fair to say no. The dung beetles are smart enough to use the light of the Milky Way, but they can't actually see it. It's just a, a bright light in the sky for them. So m because of the compound eye, most insects can't see the stars. They don't have the, the visual acuity, the, the ability to see enough detail. How about fish? Can a fish see the stars? There's a constellation called Pisces, the, the fishes uh, in the sky. So it'd be nice if they could see that. An interesting example is something called the archer fish. I don't know if you've heard about these before. So these are fish, these are hunting fish. And they eat insects by blasting them with a stream of water and knocking them out of branches uh, so they fall into the water and they can eat them. Uh, it's really ingenious, but it means they must be able to see out of the water to see the insect up there. Let me show you a quick video of this. So here's a poor insect that's going to make a meal in a minute. And watch the archer fish. What they do is they, they squirt water by rolling their tongue and using their gills. And they can shoot it like a, like a projectile uh, at these bugs. So this is what their view might look like. Uh, 
from underwater. Again, they're looking through water into the air. So it's a little fuzzy, a little blurry, but they're near the surface, so it's not so bad. And this poor insect is, is, is second days are numbered. Uh, and they're quite accurate shots, these fish. And so there's his meal. So th these fish, at least, can see pretty well out of the water, right? But they're the exception. Most fish live farther below, and sunlight and starlight has a harder time penetrating to great depths, right? So starlight just can't reach very deep. You can show that you don't have to go very far down before most of the light gets filtered out, and the only light that's making it down to the bottom, this is just 120 feet down, right? We're not talking about deep ocean, uh, is, uh, uh, is blue light. And so the bottom of the ocean is a dark, bluish kind of place. And so there are some deep sea fish, for example, that don't even have cones. They only have rods, because those are the more light sensitive detectors, and they can see whatever else uh, is out there. So that's going to make it hard for fish to see the stars, because the starlight doesn't make it very deep. Also, the, the water's never calm, right? There's ripples and turbulence, and that's going to distort any light rays from stars or from the sun that pass into it. So this is the view from underwater. As you look at the sun, it's just not real crisp. And so that's a problem for anything living under the water that wants to try and see the stars, like a bluefin, a bluefin tuna like this, for example. So can fish see the stars? And the answer is probably pretty clear. No, the water just messes up everything, right? It's just going to distort every image you, you could try and make. Whales. This is the other reason I got interested in this question. Um, I was living on Nantucket for a few years and very interested in, in uh, whales. And there was a paper that came out, I'll tell you about in a second, that seemed to suggest that whales might, that whales navigate across vast distances, uh, maybe using the stars. So there's a constellation in the sky named Cetus, which is the sea monster, but more typically it's interpreted as the whale uh, today. Uh, and we know that whales, like birds, can migrate thousands of miles. There are humpback whales that go from Alaska down to Hawaii every year. And there are other whales that go across the Atlantic down to the, the South Atlantic and that kind of thing. So the question is, how can a whale navigate thousands of miles? There are no landmarks for it to use to, to see uh, where it's going. There's been some discussion in the past, could they use the Earth magnetic field? Could they use something else? And it turns out probably not. We, we don't know. Um, the thing that got me really intrigued was this paper a few years ago. What these scientists had done was they had tagged some humpback whales. They had a little GPS thing in their back, and they could track them with satellite. And so these dots show the path that they traveled on different days as they went on this you know, thousands of mile journey to the South Atlantic. And the thing to notice is how straight the paths are. In fact, they call their paper straight as an arrow. These whales go across, along incredibly straight paths. They don't get lost, not like the dung beetles going in circles. They know where they're going. And the question is, how do they know where they're going, right? Um, so what I got interested in was, could the whales be aquatic astronomers? Could they be using the stars to navigate just as the, uh, our human ancestors did long ago, just as birds do today as well. The behavior that some whales do, like humpbacks, that got me sort of thinking is something called spy hopping. Spy hopping is basically like treading water. A whale will pop its head out of the water and just kind of hang out there for a while. And the question is, why do they do that? And nobody knows for sure. Uh, orcas spy hop a lot. Here's another example. But it's, it's believed that orcas probably do this to hear. They get their ears above water, and they're listening for seals on ice chunks out there so that they can go knock them off and eat them. Uh, but for humpbacks, that's not clear, right? They don't eat uh, other uh, uh, big creatures. Uh, and so could it be that the humpbacks, when they spy hop, are trying to see the sky above them to get their bearings, essentially? And one of the questions is, can, can, can the whale even see the stars? Right? Imagine if you're a whale. You, you, you have to um, go through an enormous range of conditions. You have to be able to pop your head up to breathe and look into the bright sunlight. 
and you have to dive down to incredible depths where it's very dark, there's not much light, the pressure is enormous, you know, it could crush some of us. Um, so how does a whale evolve an eye that can stand that wide range of conditions and would it allow them to see the stars? The first whale-like creatures went back, remember whales we believe were land animals that went back to the sea. They went back about 50 million years ago. Um, but that means they've had billions of nights in the dark, in, in the ocean to enjoy the dark skies and to maybe learn to navigate by the stars. Uh, it turns out, you know, one of the problems, if you or I go open our eyes underwater, we can't see, right? Everything's blurry and out of focus. So what do you do if you're a whale? Where part of your time is underwater, part of your time is with your head above water. It turns out, you know, when you can't see something, what do you do? You squint, right? You try and bring it into focus. You, you bend the shape of your eye. Turns out whales can do that too. So there's some suggestive evidence, not proven, that whales could, for example, maybe see perfectly fine underwater, and then when they bring their heads above water into the air, by squinting, they could change the shape of the eyeball enough to be able to focus light and maybe see what's above the uh, water as well. It's not proven, but there's evidence that that might be the case. So it raises the interesting question, could whales be navigating across thousands of miles by using the stars, just like the birds do, uh, to get their bearings? Head south, head north, head whichever direction. There's, nobody knows at the moment, but it's just an interesting speculation, so I'll just leave it as a, a question mark. Uh, let me just finish up uh, with, well, two more. Um, apes, our, our closest ancestors, right? Uh, we have a lot of similarities, of course, with, uh, with apes. Uh, we share, as you know, sort of 98 to 99% of the same uh, uh, genetic material, right? DNA. And so it turns out that apes have very similar eyes to ours. They've got cones, you know, red, green, and blue cones uh, like we do. Um, their visual acuity, their ability to see detail is pretty similar to ours. Uh, so in principle, they should be able to see the stars just as we do. It's all, always kind of uncanny how you know, human-like a lot of apes' eyes can look to us. But there's one interesting difference I learned about that I, I hadn't known before. If you look at an ape's eyes, so here's a chimp, um, you'll see that uh, you see the pupils, but you see it's brown around here. And that's common of, of pretty much all apes, except us. We've got this white around the eyes. And so the theory, the speculation, is that you know, our species, Homo sapiens, survives through um, uh, communal efforts, right? We work together. And communication is really important to us. And so by seeing the whites of the eyes, I can know which way you're looking. And you can know which way I'm looking. And that has uh, implications for a uh, society of creatures, right? To always be sort of mm, transparent or open with one another. It's just a theory, but it's really cool. And it might explain why humans have this kind of white around our eyes, whereas none of the other apes do, for example. Um, it turns out that, uh, like us, uh, apes' eyes get worse as they get older. There was a really cool experiment that showed that bonobos, so these are types of apes, very similar, uh, you know, again, share 98% of the genetic code that we do, uh, their eyes get worse over time. Now, how do you know this? You can't get a bonobo to sit in a chair and take an eye exam again. But what they did was really clever. They watched them grooming each other. They watched apes grooming each other. And what they found, you know, as you get older, uh, you get farsighted, right? So, uh, you know, sometimes until you have glasses or contact lenses, you, you got to hold the thing out here so you can try and read it. Same thing is true with bonobos. It turns out that the distance they get from each other when they groom, you know, picking uh, fleas and, and lice off each other, the distance grows as they get older. It's really clear. So they studied a group of bonobos in the Congo and found that the young ones will get just a few inches away from each other the older ones needed to stand back a little bit so they could see what they were doing. And in fact, they had a video. So and these, these bonobos range in age from 14 to 45. And they had a video of one of the bonobo from uh, 10 years earlier, so when she was much younger. And you could see she was much closer picking off the fleas and things. And 10 years later, she had to stand back so she could see what she was doing. So just like us, their eyes seem really similar. They even get worse 
uh, with time. So it raises the interesting question then, can apes see the stars, right? And then it seems like they should be able to. They've got very similar eyes to ours. Uh, so in principle, sure, why not? But then the question is, why not? Apes, as far as we know, is, uh, and I've tried to read up on this, there's no evidence of them stargazing, for example. There's certainly no evidence of them becoming astronomers or being curious about the, the stars above them. So why is that? Right? So it raises a couple interesting questions, but I think it's safe to conclude that yes, apes can in principle see the stars, but whether they choose to is a different question. And it says something interesting. Why is our species interested in the stars and other species that we share 98% of the same uh, you know, genetic uh, ancestry with have no interest in, that, in them? So let me just make a long story long. Um, the, there was a paper published last year where scientists at Duke University went through the literature in great detail and compiled every paper that's ever been published on the ability of birds, mammals, insects, fish, crustaceans to see. Their visual acuity, their ability to see detail, right? They did this for 600 species have been studied over the years. The conclusion of all of this was We're not doing so bad. Humans are actually able to see more detail with our eyes than most of the millions of species can see on this planet, or at least the 600 that they studied. So we may not see under great under faint light conditions. We don't see as well as an eagle, but we're doing pretty good compared to most creatures on our planet, right? Um, so they even have, they have this really cute software. You can upload any picture of your choice, and it will show you how it would appear to a human, to a mosquito, to a fly, to a rat, whatever you want. Um, but the bottom line is, we're actually not that bad. We're actually better than most animals uh, and creatures at, at seeing uh, clearly. Let me talk about the one species we haven't talked about yet. And this is sort of the food for thought part. And like Todd said earlier, this is the low 42 part. So what does it all mean? Who cares if animals can see the stars? But I think it actually tells us something pretty profound, right? People are interested in aliens, you know, have aliens visited Earth? Will they visit Earth someday? Is there life elsewhere in the universe? There have been over 4,000 planets discovered around other stars by today. Some of them seem uh, they could be Earth-like. And so the possibility that there might be life on other worlds, it just be, seems to become more and more likely to, to many uh, scientists' way of thinking. And so if there's life on other worlds, it could be really exotic. It could be so different from anything that we can imagine. They might have a very different star. It might be on a planet that orbits a very different star from the sun, for example, that shines in different colors than our sun does. And so maybe their eyes would evolve to respond to that. Maybe they have a really thick atmosphere that you can't even see the stars because the light can't penetrate through. So even if life is abundant all across the universe, whether or not creatures in other worlds would be able to see the stars uh, or would be interested in looking at the stars is a question that we don't know. Uh, again, if you look at our own planet as an example, uh, certainly you know, most of the millions, all but one actually, of all the millions of species aren't interested in looking at the stars for scientific purposes. And the few that seem to look at the stars do it for survival reasons, to migrate and to do all those sorts of things. So if the universe is filled with life, there may be lots of places where that life couldn't care less about other stars and other planets and might not even be able to see them. So can aliens see the stars? And the question is, who knows? Depends on, depends on the aliens, right? Um, so let me just finish up with this. The, the, the thing that I, I find really intriguing by all of this is, I, I go back to my original question of, you know, why can't Max see the stars, my dog? And it makes me realize that most of the species on our planet can't see the stars. And some that can, like our ape cousins, seem to have no interest in looking at the stars. So it makes me stop and ask myself, how much is going around me that I'm completely unaware of, right? Stuff that's going on that I don't perceive, that I can't grasp, because I don't have the, the faculties to do that, right? So it's, it's I think, a kind of sober reminder that you know, we may not, uh, there may be a lot going on around us that we're not aware of. So it brings me back to Max. Uh, 
I'm disappointed that Max doesn't want to look at the stars. He seems to have no interest. But maybe Max is disappointed that I can't smell like he does. And to him, the world is just a cornucopia of odors and things to sniff. And he's disappointed that I can't share in that with him. You never know. Um, so let me just give you my conclusions. Uh, I think it's pretty clear. Some animals can see the stars, but most of them probably can't. And as far as we know, we're the only ones that seem to be interested in actually doing astronomy and figuring out what those points of light uh, in the sky are. And uh, I'll stop there. Thank you.